There we go. All right, so I'd like to acknowledge that Creative Saskatchewan supports creative entrepreneurs throughout the entire province of Saskatchewan in treaties two, four, five, six, eight, and 10, which encompasses the unceded territories of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Dene nations, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that today's workshop is sponsored by West, or sorry, supported in part by um, Western Economic Diversification Canada. Thank you so much for your support. And finally, I am so excited to introduce today's speaker. Um, today we have joining us Barbara Hausen. Um, Barbara Hausen has over 30 years experience working in the publishing industry, both in Canada and the UK. Before starting Hausen Consulting, Barbara was Vice President of Sales and Licensing at House of Anansi and Groundwood Books for 10 years. She worked with a brilliant team that saw significant revenue growth in Canada and the United States. As a consultant, Barbara has worked with several publishers and organizations, including Portage in Maine, University of Toronto Press, Greystone Books, eBound Canada, and Canada Books. She is on the Industry Advisory Board for Centennial College Publishing Program. She has also written several industry reports, most recently as co-author of Accessible Publishing Research Project on behalf of eBound Canada. Um, I'd also like to note that Barbara will be answering questions throughout today's presentation, so please submit any questions that you might have as they pop up to you in the Q&A function um, down below or in the chat. Um, you also have the option to submit questions anonymously via the Q&A function if you please. Um, I think that's everything I had to mention, um, so welcome Barbara and take it away. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're just going to get the PowerPoint started. And there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to uh, discuss a year in selling rights. Next slide. So what we're going to cover is uh, which books do we would I recommend selling rights to, which fairs I would recommend going to, best, practice for, best practices for attending fairs, how to do a deal or sort of a top line of um, deal making. I am uh, one of the requ uh, previous requests for um, or questions before this uh, seminar was about film rights. So I'm going to do a quick overview of uh, film rights and selling film rights and things to watch out for. Um, film rights is very complicated, so this is not going to be in depth um, at, by any stretch of the imagination, but it will be a quick overview. And then, of course, as Andrea said, if you want to, if things, um, I don't go into enough detail on things, or if there is a question that pops up, please um, put it in the chat or the Q&A, and um, I'm more than happy to answer them as I go along. I don't believe in any bad questions, and probably if you're questioning something, somebody else is too. Next slide. So we'll start with which books. Um, not all of your books or merchandise or anything that you're selling, chat books, um, will work in the international market. Um, and that includes the United States. Uh, things that work really well in Canada don't necessarily travel. So when I'm looking at a list, um, I look for certain things um, that I think will work and I look for certain things that I don't think will work. Um, I'm going to sort of start with things that don't work, and that's actually further down the list that you'll see, which is um, very short. Uh, short stories tend not to work, drama tends not to work, and poetry tends not to work. Uh, short stories you can sell in the international market and in the translation market and into the US, but basically what people will be asking you is, um, does this author have a novel? Um, so they might buy the short story collection just to sort of show support for the author, but only if they know that there's a novel coming down the uh, transom. And quite often publishers will buy books from um, authors knowing that they um, have an, an option on the novel, or maybe they've licensed the next book from the author at the same time. So those are three um, categories that do like don't work very well. So if I'm going to start selling international rights, these are not where I'm going to announce my list to the world. This is not where I'm going to start um, when I'm announcing my list to the world. Um, academic books uh, can do really, really well. 
Um, but once again, it really depends if it's if it's, you know, the study of 19th century Canadian women in medicine or something like that, that probably is not going to travel. But if it's something more universal, like about climate change or something like that, then um, the book probably uh, could could work in different markets. So going back up to the top of the list, that's what I do. I look for universals. And by that, I mean things that are uh, represent um, everybody's experience one way or the other. Um, universals could be about love. It could be about climate change. It could be about um, things that everybody can experience and, um, and want to read about. And the other universal is good writing. Um, I know that's easy to say, and um, you know everybody thinks that their book that they're publishing is the best writing ever, and that's how we support our authors. But sometimes writing is not as good as other writing. And so that is what people are 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 looking for, especially when you're competing and you're competing with the world. And let's just be realistic about that. We are competing with the world. So the picture, the slides there um, beside this is the break, which we published at House of Nancy. This was a debut novel by Katharina Vermette, and um, we went on to sell it in over six languages and, um, and English language rights. We sold Australia and the UK separately. And I think what is important to note about this on the surface, this is about an Indigenous family in Winnipeg. It is a very local book, but the universals are fantastic writing and it's about family and family overcoming trauma and supporting each other. And the characters are well drawn. And we were able to sell it on that basis, even though it's based in a very local way and it's about indigenous trauma. So when you're looking at your list, that's how you should look at it. And the other thing to note is we sold this book before it was actually published in um, English Canada. So it wasn't well reviewed. There were no prizes. What we did ha have going for it, it was a debut. And it's really interesting to me. I've never quite figured out, but debuts are something that uh, people like to look at, whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Um, people like to know about the new writers. They want to maybe get on the ground floor with somebody who's going to go from success to success. And Katharina Vermette's um, latest novel, which is a sequel to The Break, which is published by Hamish Hamilton, has just been on the Giller Long List. So, you know, it's, it's, she, she is a fantastic writer who's just gonna grow and grow. And so all of these other people who bought into her when she was, um, when this was a de debut for her, um, then, uh, you know, they feel that they've gotten in the ground floor. It's not to say that she wasn't an established writer. She was publishing um, kids books with Portage in Maine um, in Manitoba, and she was doing uh, some graphic novels for Portage in Maine. But, but with the break, it was sort of her, her breakout um, first novel. So the other thing people look for are well-reviewed uh, books, and so that can bring it to the top of a uh, foreign rights or a foreign publishers uh, list. Uh, well-reviewed, and I mean not just in small town reviews, I mean well-reviewed um, by um, you know the New York Times or Vancouver Sun or the Winnipeg Free Press or or anything um, along those lines. Um, but also I think more and more people are looking at Instagram um, um, influencers and they're looking at um, more social media and Facebook. And if things are getting sort of hype um, on those social media platforms that can definitely be used to push your book out into the international market. Prizes are obviously one of the key um, selling points that I would always mention, um, especially if it was for a previous book and this is the new book. Um, so it's very, very, very important to um, highlight prizes. Um, and then the other thing I do in selling, picking books for my list that I'm selling in the international market is I pick books for the, from the following year. Now these are books, if it's Frankfurt, that I know I'm gonna have a manuscript by say January, 2020, so it's Frankfurt this year, 2021. 
I need to know that I'm going to have a manuscript that I that the editor will allow me to submit by at least January 2022, or I'm not going to launch it till till the London Book Fair. But I call this sort of the Amazon effect and the Australian copyright uh, rule effect, um, especially when you're trying to sell rights into English language territories such as Australia and uh, the UK, it's really, really important to um, sell that book before you've published it in Canada or anywhere in the world. In the UK, it's because of Amazon. If your metadata gets up onto Amazon, then even if an editor likes it, she'll take the book to the uh, marketing department and the marketing department will say that your book is impinging on their market. The UK is a, is a surprisingly small market um for selling books and anything that they feel impinges on their market um, um they sort of will say no to especially if it's they're taking a bit of a flyer on it um and also with brexit um i still don't know um how that is going to affect the uk market because the uk publishers would tend to take distribution rights into the eu and i know that's not going to be as straightforward with Brexit. The other issue, oops, sorry, not quite finished. The other issue is for um, Australia, and I don't know if people know this, but um, the copyright law in Australia says that if the book is published anywhere in the world um, um, and it's not released into Australia within 30 days, then there is no exclusivity. So it's not to say an Australian publisher won't publish it. Um, it just means that you won't get a big in advance. And also, once again, it's a barrier and who wants to put up a barrier? Um, they want to make sure that they have exclusive rights in their territory. So I think um, it's, it's really important to look at your list and try and sell forward. This is much more important than, um, um, than it is, say, in selling into your local bookstore or anything like that. It's, this is the one big difference in selling rights as opposed to selling into the Canadian or US market if you're doing distribution. Selling forward is, to my mind, a key to success. Okay, next. So which fairs? Um, if you're doing adult books, uh, I would say London and Frankfurt are your key book fairs to sell uh, rights. Um, what I like about London and, and Frankfurt is that um, um, they they happen six or yeah close to six months apart. So you um, you can do your pitch in London and you can follow up in Frankfurt, or do your pitch in Frankfurt and follow up in London. And it's sort of, it's a calendarization that um, um, editors who are looking to buy books are um, used to. They're used to seeing new books for in London that will be for the fall or maybe the spring titles for 20, say 2021. And then looking at maybe the spring titles for 2022. And then at Frankfurt, they're used to looking at maybe a book that they missed because it's now on the Giller Prize list or it's now in the uh, Governor General's award or the writer's trust um, and they overlooked it so now maybe they'll have another look at it um, but they'll also want to look at spring 2022 and fall 2022 if you have the books uh, guadalajara is really great for academic publishers and it's really great for for business or and kids publishers canadian fiction and maybe non-fiction not so much uh, this is trade fiction and non-fiction um, the, the Latin American market is um, kind of more geared to what they call bestsellers and they want to know what your bestsellers are and basically what they mean is, is you know, Marion Taves or, or somebody along those lines. Um, um, or Penny, um, the mystery writers whose name has gone completely out of my head, that kind of person. Um, the, but the Guadalajara Guadalajara is really great for, um, it happens in November, and it's really great for the Spanish language market. A lot of publishers from Spain come to it. And interestingly enough, um, though it's Spanish focus, the Brazilian publishers also come up for it. Um, it's not that far to get to, and, um, and it can lead to some very, very interesting deals or distribution 
um, English distribution of your books. Um, that is another reason why I would go to that uh, fair is to find a distributor of my books into that territory. So next, Bologna Book Fair. Um, that is for children's uh, publishers only. It happens in, um, in uh, end of March, April. If I'm a children's publisher, I would not go to the London Book Fair. Um, I actually even wouldn't go to Frankfurt unless I'm well established. I would go to the uh, Bologna. That is the one fair that I would go to. Um, I would start belonging to international organizations that meet at Bologna. I would encourage my illustrators to exhibit at Bologna. They have um, awards at Bologna. It is really, really, really important to go to Bologna if you are a children's um, bookseller or uh, publisher rather. Um, and then I would might go to Guadalajara depending on my list. If it's very literary, if it's very um, Canadian oriented, I wouldn't go to Guadalajara. I would just concentrate on the Bologna Book Fair. Next. And then um, this is Sharjah and this is the Gotberg um, Book Fair. Um, Gotberg is in Sweden. It happens in September. Sharjah happens usually in uh, November. So why am I putting these book fairs in? I wouldn't necessarily go to them to exhibit, but they have brilliant fellowship programs, um, as does Frankfurt. Um, interestingly enough, Bologna does not. Um, and I don't know about London, actually. I don't think they do. But uh, Frankfurt, Gottberg, and Sharjah have fellowship programs. And um, if you're not familiar with um, fellowship programs, I highly recommend applying for them. Not only do you get to know more about the market that you're visiting at the book fair, um, you are getting to know the other people who come as uh, fellows. At Frankfurt, it's usually, I think, um, between 20 to 30 um, uh, publishers, agents, rights people who are invited. And um, you go uh, there the week before the book fair, you travel around Germany, you meet publishers from around Germany, you go to the book fair, you go to all the events at the book fair. Um, so you are spending intensive time with other publishers, rights people, and um, as well as meeting all the German publishers. And it can set you up beautifully to really, really hit the rights market um, running. And it's the same with Gottberg. This year it was focused on children's publishers. So they, it's virtual, but they did do a, um, a, fellow, a fellowship program um, for children's publishers. Um, virtual is obviously, in my opinion, not as good as um, meeting people in person but um, it would definitely be a way to kickstart your program. Um, Sharjah does the same thing. And it's, from, it's publishers from around the world who go to this book fair. And you're at Sharjah, I, um, two of my colleagues went and you're basically treated like royalty there. Um, you are so well looked after and um, it, is, it is really, really, really fabulous. And it's a really great way of meeting other publishers. Um, as I said, not just in the country. So that's why I put those um, two fairs in. I wouldn't necessarily recommend, as I said, being an exhibitor there, but I'd definitely be looking um, at them for the fellowship program. The other fellowship program is the Sydney's Writer Writers Festival in Australia. And one day when we all get to travel and Australia opens up their doors, that's worth attending. Um, it is not for rights people. It is only for editors and they prefer publishers uh, or the owners of um, publishing companies. But once again, it's well worth um, um, applying for if you have um, the time and, and you would have to normally pay for all of these, you would normally have to pay for your flight there. Um, I think Shar Sharjah used to pay for the, the flight, but I think they stopped that. Um, so you used to have, uh, you pay for your flight, but once you're there, your hotel and everything else is covered. So it is just the cost of a flight, which down to Australia is not an insignificant investment. Next. So pre-fair preparation. Um, one day we will all be there in person. Um, and I do think that is the best way to do uh, book fairs. 
Um, I think doing book fairs now in the virtual world, it's great if you already know people and um, you can make meetings with people and they know your books and they want to meet with you. But trying to actually meet new people, I think is very, very hard um, digital, uh, in this digital environment. But um, each of the fairs have risen to the challenge. And so I would definitely get to know what the digital assets for each fair is offering. Um, as I discussed before, pick the books that you want um, to present to the international market and research your potential clients. Um, it, part of the resources that was sent out before the workshop was, um, was a resource list. And, you know, I don't know, like a lot of the time when I was um, doing in-house working, I would research um, clients. So when Anansi started selling mystery, we had never sold mystery before. So I had to find a whole new clientele who would be interested in, in those type of books rather than my literary fiction books. So there's publisher marketplace. If you go onto the bookseller, which is the UK publishing magazine, you look at the deals and who's buying and who's selling. Um, if you go into the, um, the equivalent of uh, the Australian magazine, it's the same thing. Um, if you're looking for film producers, go to Playback. Um, I've given you the link there. It's um, really important to keep, I, I, I'm uh, signed up for all of these newsletters so that I can see what is happening. And Publishers Marketplace, I have to tell you, is one of the, you can get their newsletters for free, you can get their deal memos for free or their deal announcements for free. And you can see who's buying and usually you actually get the contact name and you can usually figure out um, what their email address is. The other thing I do pre-fair is I find out if any of these um, fairs have international publishing organizations on the resource list. I've sent you a couple. The kids list, the kids publishers tend to be a lot more organized. There's Ibi International, there's the White Ravens in Germany um, organization. Um, there's various organizations that you can be a part of um, or sign up for their newsletters and find out what's going on in the international publishing market. Plan on being social. Um, I notice that a lot of uh, Canadians tend to socialize with Canadians. You can do that at home. Um, well, maybe not if they're from different parts of the country, but generally um, um, I feel that Canadians tend to socialize with Canadians at fairs. That is a mistake. You were there to socialize, I highly recommend, with other people from other countries. Um, if this is your first fair, talk to other Canadian publishers and maybe you guys can get together. I've done this a lot with a bunch of different publishers and we bring different publishers together. Uh, Lever Canada Books does um, dinners. The embassies quite often do uh, parties. Um, so, and you're often asked to invite people, so invite people. And then stay on top of international publishing trends. Um, you know, are, are books from indigenous publisher or authors of interest in the market right now? Um, are dyst is dystopia. Um, you know, I remember when Harry Potter was first being pitched, nobody would buy it because it was too long and children wouldn't have enough attention span to read a Harry Potter book. Well, they were wrong. Um, and, you know, trilogies weren't in. And, all this kind of stuff, things change. And, you know, one of the key things I do is read the bookseller. I read Publishers Re Weekly. I read Shelf Awareness. I'm always looking at what's on top of, of the market and maybe how I can pitch my book, which might not be on trend, but might be sort of slightly on trend, or maybe it could start the new trend. But if you're not on top of um, international trends, then, um, you don't know necessarily how you can pitch your book. Um, are there any questions, Andrea? Yes, um, we have one question here. Um, it says, no Saskatchewan publisher has been included in the LCB mentorship or selected for a trade delegation slash fellowship. How can a small regional press increase chances of a su successful application to be included? Um, well, the mentorships are, um, you have to ask. They don't select people for the mentorships. Um, you just write to Christy um, Doucette and say, I would like a mentor. Um, um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, for, sorry, what was the rest of it? Um, 
has not been included in the LCB mentorship or selected for a trade delegation slash fellowship, how can a small regional press increase chances of a successful application to be included? Okay, so the the uh, delegations have changed. Um, now, in the old days, you used to, um, they would pay for your way and all that kind of stuff. Now they're not. Um, but once again, I would contact Christy and say, I am interested in, a, in part participating in a delegation. How do I do that? Um, um, I think that's the best way. Um, but uh, nowadays you have to pay to join rather than, um, oh, Christy Doucette. Um, Christy Doucette is the program director. I can send Andrea her contact details um, and um, um, you can contact her. Um, um, that, that would be the best way of doing it, I think. Um, but it's really contacting them and telling them that this is, you would like to participate more or get on the board. Um, you know, uh, the board is, is there's an ACP. I don't know if anybody who's a member of the L, I don't know if the LPG sends a member. I know um, ACUP sends a member and uh, ACP sends a member, um, but get on the board. Um, but it has to be done through one of those organizations. I'm sorry, I'm not up to date on how the board is picked um, since I'm not, no longer a member of the ACP, but um, that is usually how it is done. If anything is unclear, let me know. Okay, so um, for your presentation, especially if you're doing it digitally, um, I would really recommend that you categorize your, your um, books that would so you can easily do it in a PowerPoint. I would definitely recommend doing it in a PowerPoint um, rather than just holding up your book and uh, talking to people that way. But categorize your books as fiction, nonfiction. If you have kids' books, picture books, and by age range. Um, usually, the editor is looking for um, one thing or the other. The editors tend to be. Um, uh, nonfiction editors or fiction editors or academic editors, or if it's kids books, they tend to focus on picture books, or they tend to focus on age ranges and things like that. So do it in a PowerPoint and um, divvy it up by category so that you can go through it easily. One day when we all get to go to Frankfurt and London and Bologna and things like that, you don't have to maybe categorize your books so much, but definitely when you display them, I would put all of my fiction together, all of my nonfiction for the walk by traffic together up on the stand. Covers, 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 covers. Um, I would have this argument with the editors all the time. Um, quite often the cover, especially in the adult world is done at the very last minute. In the kids world, it's usually done earlier because we have such uh, long timelines, especially if doing distribution in the US. Um, and at times I would just say, give me a fake cover. Give me a cover that might not be the final cover, um, but it's close enough and we're comfortable enough with it that I can show it um, because it's weird. You're selling to editors who often or usually will buy a book without a cover because that's how you buy it um, from an agent or from you know over the transom or anything like that. But when you're selling internationally, the publisher wants to know, especially if they don't know you well, they want to know what your vision is for this book. They want, and the easiest way they can do that is from a cover. I mean, it's how um, people buy, buy books in a bookstore and stuff like that. This is kind of the same thing. And it's really interesting to me how having a cover and not having a cover makes a big difference on pitching a book. Um, people can, look at the cover while you're doing your pitch and you're going through the description of the book and saying why they should buy it and saying what's special about this book. But the cover is worth a thousand words. Um, so even if it's a fake cover, and I use fake covers a number of times, have a cover. Um, sometimes this, I know this means extra work for the designers, um, but if, if, I, if your sales will do so much better. 
Um, and, you know, once again, I'm trying to, I'm going to reiterate, I'm trying to sell the book before the book's published. So that is why the cover might not be the final cover. And then for illustrated books, um, whether it's adult nonfiction or fiction or, or whatever, once again, have at least three to four spreads, inside spreads, so that people can see what the book is going to look like and what the art looks like. Um, and it's really, really important so that they can see the layout and the design. Obviously, if you're a new publisher in the rights market, I would probably sell as, from as much of the finished book as you possibly can because people um, don't know you and don't have a working relationship with you. But when you have a working relationship with people, you can do it from the three um, spreads or whatever, especially if this is a, a second book by an existing author, you can have the finished book um, of the first book by the author, and then have the second book there, which might just have a cover and three inside spreads. Are there awards? Are there really good blurbs? So this is, you know, blurbs will get before the book is published, and it goes a long way to having a blurb by somebody who's well established um, in the mystery market, or the thriller market, or the romance market, or the kids market. Um, the other thing I, I would do is if I have a really good blurb from um, somebody who's already a well-established writer, and this is a debut author, I will go to the publishers of that person who gave the blurb and say, so-and-so gave the blurb for this book. Do you want to have a look at this book? Because he liked it and you pub or they liked it and you published it. So it's, 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 a, it's a very good um, sales tool, having blurbs, not only into the retail market in Canada and the US, but also into the international market because it can give you an entree into a publisher who you might not normally deal with. Starred reviews, especially for kids' books, are really important. And any previous international sales, there's um, authors who, who might have published with uh, larger publishers who are now publishing with smaller publishers and their previous books had really um, good international sales. Well, you as a smaller publisher can take that author and go back to the original publishers and see if they want this new book. Um, so it's very important to keep, um, to get that information from your authors who are, um, who are previous published. And sometimes um, I've noticed publishers don't ask previously pu published um, um, uh, authors for that information, and you really should. It should be part of your intake um, um, form with the authors. Okay, any questions? We've got two questions um, for this one. Um, the first one was, typically, how many titles would you be pitching in a PowerPoint presentation such as this? Five, 10 books? Um, I'd be pitching as many as I thought would sell. Um, I, there is no limit as far as I'm concerned. Um, um, I would, what I would do, but I would definitely categorize them. Um, so, and I wouldn't go deep into my backlist. So that's going to cut it all down for you anyways, because I'm not saying, I'm really not advocating that you pitch from books from 2017. I think um, that's too hard to sell because there's too many questions as to why you haven't already sold international rights for that book, especially if you're starting out selling international rights. Um, so you'd be pitching maybe fall 20, where are we, 2021, um, fall 2020, if anything that had really good reviews or good sales, I guess that's the other thing I haven't um, sort of mentioned is if your book is selling five to 10,000 copies in Canada, I would definitely be pitching it. Um, um, uh, and then I would be pitching spring 2021, fall 2021 and spring 2022. But I would be pretty selective about fall 2020 and only highlight a couple of titles. And I'd only be going for um, books in spring 2022 that I thought I would have a manuscript by January. So that's naturally going to, to make limit your resource or your pitch or your, your presentation. And the other thing is, you know, if you're, if you're a general publisher and you have fiction and nonfiction, you're just gonna whiz over if you're meeting with a fiction editor, all the nonfiction stuff, you're not gonna show that to them. Um, you're only gonna show them the fiction. So that, that's why you have to categorize the books. 
um, and, and make it so that you can whiz through parts of your presentation. Does that help? Uh, that's great. Um, for the second question, um, we had for children's books, is it better to be pre-publication at rights fairs or is it more difficult to sell a recently published Canadian title? Um, well, it depends on the recently published. I mean, if, if you've got really great reviews, then no. Um, if you have really great sales, if you have awards, no, it's, it's not hard to sell. Um, it, it would be hard to probably sell into the English language because the book's already published. And as I said, in Australia, the copyright rule, you, you can't give them an exclusive. And your book, if you go on to part of my resources, I said Amazon is a resource. So if you go on to amazon.co.uk and look up your book and see if there's a buy button there, then you're not going to sell it in the UK. Because as I said, the salespeople will say you're selling it in the UK. I'm not going to buy it from you. But um, if you have no story, um, then it's harder to sell, um, would be my assessment. So the story is good awards, good sales, good blurbs, starred reviews. And then, yes, you could definitely sell it. Okay, next. So at the fair, don't do a deal. I know this is counterintuitive, but if somebody comes on the stand and from say Germany and really, really likes your book, 10 to one, another German publisher will really, really, really like your book. So what you wanna do is ideally, you wanna get an auction situation going. So the more German publishers you have who like your book that you can contact after the fair and say, this was the book of the fair, I, I am, this is a multiple submission, um, this is really um, a book that you need to be top of mind on. Or even if you give, I am taking um, offers for this book, you know, two weeks later, that's what you want. Ideally, that is what you want. You just don't want to have one publisher interested in your book. So first and foremost, do not do a deal at the fair. What you're there to do is to get interest for your books. What you're there to do is look at possible distribution arrangements. Um, what you're there to do is figure out um, what is sort of working in the market. So in order to do that, I highly recommend that you uh, take time away from selling to walk the fair, especially if this is your first time there and you don't have a stand, you're going to be walking the fair anyway. I, I don't know how many people have been to Frankfurt. Uh, maybe we can have a show of hands, but Frankfurt is huge. And um, it can take you days to walk the fair. Um, and literally, I mean that days. Um, there are, you know, at least five halls. They're huge halls and um, they're all spread out. Bologna is smaller. London is smaller, but it's huge. Um, so walk the fair. Pick certain territories that you really, really want to make inroads in. Is it Germany? Is it France? Is it Italy? Um, the Nordic countries, I got to tell you, are kind of hard. They're really only interested in bestsellers. Um, so I probably wouldn't recommend starting there unless you want to feel sad. Um, but but uh, Holland is another really good territory for Canadian books. And as I said, Latin America is a really, really good territory for um, or area for, um, for Canadian books. So go to those stands, see what they're selling. Um, even if you don't know the language, it's amazing what you can pick up from the cover of a book. And then the other thing I highly recommend people do that I don't think they do enough is visit local bookstores. Um, see what they're selling. Um, see how big their English language section is. Um, if you're doing distribution through a UK distributor, is your book there? If it's not, then maybe you need to contact your UK distributor and say, why not? Um, I think it's really, really in, important to, to reach out to the community um, and, and see what's happening in those areas. Um, the other thing when you're pitching at a fair, and, and even when you're doing it um, virtually, 
is be 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 aware of what you're pitching and how you're pitching and the feedback. I really believe when pitching, it is a conversation. It is just not you throwing information at the editor and seeing where it lands. It needs to, the best thing to do is, is try and start a conversation and get feedback from that editor. And if they really, really like a book, maybe they like a book for the reason that you never thought of. And so I would take that information and I'd totally change my pitch for the next person. The other thing is if they say no to everything, then ask them what's, what's working in their market? What, um, um, what, what are they doing well with? What, what are they really happy with um, in, in their list for the fall? What are they excited about? Um, and, then, and then maybe there's a book that you didn't pitch that maybe you need to bring forward. Or maybe there's something that you're going to be doing that you know in fall 2022 that you don't have, but you would like to send it to them and get permission to do that. So pitching, which isn't on my list here, but pitching is really important and pitching to my mind it's not like when you're selling to a bookstore. This is, you're selling to editors and they, they know their list. They know what they're passionate about. And what you wanna find out is what they are passionate about and then bring that back into the conversation and bring that back to, to your list. And I have found that that is the most successful way of actually selling books um, in the international market. And, um, and as I said, be social. So a lot, a lot of the times at the fairs, they have, uh, you know, Australia will have a party at the stand. Um, France will have a party at the stand. Canada will have a party at the stand. Then uh, go to these parties. You might not know anybody, but maybe you will. Uh, maybe there was somebody you just pitched to was your last client um, that you pitched to and they're at the party. So go up and talk to them. Um, we tend to be very shy about this. And um, in the rights market, you can't be. Um, the other thing in Germany, one day when we all get to go, um, there is the Frankfurter Hof that everybody goes to after the fair, after their dinners and stuff like that. And a lot of business happens at the Frankfurter Hof. So um, it's really, really important to be social and not just with other Canadians. So is there another question? Um, I am not seeing. Oh, yep. Sorry, just popped up. Um, do you take only an iPad slash laptop for the digital presentation of your book pitches along with your business card? Or do you have hard copies of rights catalogs that you bring along always for them? Um, I, okay. I, I'm old. Um, so I like rights catalogs. Um, and I tend to bring books. Um, whether that happens after the pandemic is all over and we get to travel, I don't know. Um, I think things um, will change. Um, I tend to, I don't, um, my rights catalog, and I'll, okay, so this was a groundwood rights catalog. I don't know, like that's my hand, so you can see how big it is. So I don't tend to take a big catalog that might look like that heavy because I'm very aware that people pick up stuff at um, book fairs and then leave it in their hotel room because they realize that they have too much stuff and they're going to be overweight. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into having a paper catalog like that. I don't, I, the, the jury's out on whether that's going to be necessary after after this. Um, I do think it's easier to look at a catalog like this and make notes and, and I, I feel rather than a PDF, it's, it's more, I, I personally prefer the paper. I guess that's what I'm saying. I want my paper catalog. However, it's expensive and it wastes paper and right now paper is in short supply. So um, um, would it be a good idea? No. So would I bring my iPad? Yes. The problem for me with the iPad is it can run out of juice. It can, um, Wi-Fi is uh, horrible in my experience at all fairs. It bugs out at the worst time. Um, doing, you know, getting a package uh, for your phone is stupidly expensive. Um, um, 
so you could be doing a presentation and it's just going to cost you a fortune to 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 have your wi-fi up and running and all that kind of stuff so i i don't know it's uh i prefer paper it's there it's tangible and one of the things that i would do is when i would um, go to the fairs i would actually pack some of these because just in case the lcb shipment got lost or my shipment of books got lost and it happens then i would have the important books um, other people ha I have definitely seen just bring an iPad and whip through their presentation. Um, but sometimes people actually want to pick up a book and read it in their hotel room. I've had deals like we had a book called The Girl Runner by Carrie Snyder, where we were handing out arts left, right and center. And we did four deals um, just after the fair. Um, because of that, people were reading it. I had people coming on the stand making offers. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm on the fence. So I'm not going to be giving you a definitive answer, I'm afraid. In the old days when we printed, we printed um, a catalog like this for at least two fairs. So this would have been, we would print this for Bologna and we would print this for Frankfurt. So we would probably print two or 300 copies and they would go. Um, um, and I, I would do a catalog like this and um, part of what I did with your rights timeline that I sent everybody beforehand was I would do a PDF and then three weeks before the fair started I would send out a hot uh, mail a hot list email out to everybody with the catalog attached and you would be I, I would be amazed people would open my, up my email look at the catalog and come to the stand wanting specifically to talk to me about books that they had marked up. Um, um, so yes, definitely believe in a catalog. I'm on the fence on whether it should be digital or um, print. Sorry, I'm blathering. But it's, it's tough because I haven't been to a fair since Frankfurt 2019 or Guadalajara 2019. So things change. Okay, next slide. Post fair, as you can see, I'm pretty emphatic that people need to follow up. <laughs> and I'm always amazed that um, people don't follow up. So you've just spent a fortune of your time and other people's time and um, money, and you've had these meetings and I would have a lot of meetings. Basically, I would have meetings every half hour um from starting at uh, nine in the morning ending at five and then i would go out to dinner with clients and things like that so um i have a, and there would you know and nancy is well established so we would have two or three people taking these meetings so we had a lot of meetings um but i would follow up and follow up means a letter sending the material um and I would make sure that we were done the follow up no longer than two to three weeks after the fair. And you would be, I'm always amazed that people don't follow up until maybe the next fair. So if you were at Bologna, you'd follow up with them at Frankfurt. Um, you wouldn't send them materials and things like that. Well, you, you're not going to get a deal if you don't send them the materials and you're not going to get a deal if you don't email the client and um, let them know what's happened. And that's why I said be better than the big publishers, because there's some big publishers who don't follow up properly. So I always felt that I was a small publisher and I was always up against the agents and I was always up against Random House and HarperCollins and the agents. So I just always felt that I needed to be very client service oriented. And if somebody said jump, I would say how high. Not when I was negotiating, but just when I was trying to get the person um, interested so um i send an email and i send the materials out as soon as possible if i have a lot of interest from one country i tell everybody that it's a multiple submission um and if i really have a, a really like serious interest that somebody's already made an offer i say there's an offer on the table you have a week to get back to me with an offer um in, and so then I get into sort of a mini auction situation, which is always fun, always like that. Um, so, and that's ideally what you want is you want to get as much interest from one territory as you possibly can. 
And then don't be shy, um, send information, uh, especially around the fall, like this is award season. So you're at Frankfurt and I don't know for the love of God, why the governor general's awards always announce after Frankfurt. I think they've stopped doing that. Maybe they have started doing it around Frankfurt, but for a long time they would announce the shortlist after Frankfurt and you'd be sitting there. We could have used this as a, a really good selling tool. Um, but you've got Frankfurt and you've got the Giller winner and you've got the um, Writers Trust winners announced. Um, you have reviews coming out. You have the best of list. This, you know, best books for Christmas list, best gift books, those, those anything that you can get onto, like the CBC or, or your local newspaper or whatever. Don't be shy about emailing people who are looking at your book saying, just want to update you more great reviews, more awards, more sales. Maybe you broke 5,000 copies. Maybe you broke 10,000 copies. Um, do not be shy about telling people this information. Even if you get a no or are ghosted, and a lot of people, um, uh, publishers, especially when they're breaking into this market, get really disconcerted that they never hear from the editor ever again. Um, editors are busy. Um, probably that means no, they just can't be bothered to write to you. Fine. It's kind of rude, but um, keep in touch anyways. Set, put them on your newsletter list. Um, meet at, make an appointment at the next fair. Tell them, you know, this book that you saw that I haven't heard from you. I mean, maybe not put that in, but just say that, that the book that I sent you, you know, sold. Maybe you sold it in France and this is a German publisher. Well, tell them especially in the international market, they're not competitors, but they're very interested if a French publisher, a German publisher is quite often interested if a French publisher um, buys a book. Their markets are surprisingly close and, um, and so they are very much interested in that information. So do keep people in the loop about the success you're having with your book. And that will increase your sales substantially. Next slide. The deal. Okay, so what I'm going to describe is not an auction. That is a whole other half hour. What I'm describing is a deal where you have one person who comes to you and says, I would like to buy your book. So territory can be complicated. Um, an English language publisher from the UK will come to you and ask for world rights. And they'll often include Canada in that world rights. And you'll often have to remind them that you're a Canadian publisher. I'm not including Canada. And I'm actually not joking about that. Um, but they'll probably want uh, world English excluding Canada. They might even want the US. That's up to you to decide. My belief in territory is to make it as small as possible. I, my whole philosophy around deal making is to give away as little as I possibly can. And that's even when I'm negotiating with a Random House, a HarperCollins or whatever. My philosophy is if you can't actually work with that territory or that language or that um, format or that subsidiary rights, why am I giving it to you? Maybe I can do something with it. So it's the same with French and it's the same with Spanish. These are sort of the key territories where uh, a French publisher from Paris will ask you for world rights. Um, this is really true in the adult market and in the academic market. And then what you will find as a Canadian publisher is that they will do, you will get a distribution royalty, which means 10% of net, which is basically 10% of very little. And they'll maybe put 50 copies into Quebec and it will only sell maybe 10 copies because a book that should be priced at $19.95 in Quebec will actually, they will price it at $50 and then nobody will buy it. So that Canadian author who really should be published in French by a Quebec publisher will not see the light of day in, um, or see very little in the light of day in Quebec. Um, so I'm very, especially for French, I try and sell to a Quebec publisher first. And if it's a smart um, publisher in France, they know the Quebec publishers can get a lot of money for translation. 
um, from our government. Um, so often they will do deals with Quebec publishers to buy the translation from them at a reduced cost. So I tend to um, divide up the territory as much as possible. I try to sell to a, an Australian publisher separate than from a UK publisher. <clears throat> um, in Spanish language, I try and sell, <coughs> excuse me, I try and um, sell to a uh, publisher, say in Mexico, maybe give them the US, maybe not, it depends on the publisher. So I, I'm always trying to divvy these things up so that I can maximize um, income. The language, is it English, Spanish? That's a pretty self-explanatory um, term. Once again, shorter the better, better. I've given as short as three years. People don't like that. I understand that. So five is the norm. 10 is what it used to be, but I've sort of dialed it back. Where you will not find any give is if you um, sell to um, one of the multinationals in the US or in um, the UK, they will want it for copyright, and I just don't argue anymore. I've given up that one. I've lost that one. So if anybody wins that one, let me know. Um, format. Basically, people want hardcover, paperback, and ebook. I really wouldn't be giving audio to anybody. Um, I think you probably can do audio, especially with the resurgence of audio in Canada. In, say, 10 years ago, I might give audio to somebody else because there was no audio happening in Canada, but now there is, so I would be reluctant to give audio. Plus I probably might wanna license audio to people and then if, or to companies like Audible or whatever, then um, I'd rather do that for World English myself. Um, if it's French or if it's German or Italian, I would want to know that they're actually gonna do it and they're not gonna license it. So um, that would be one of the questions that I would be asking. Um, in Germany, there are still houses that only publish hardcover books and they sub-license paperback rights. So be very clear that what you're giving them is you're giving them hardcover and you're not giving them the subsidiary right to sub-license to a paperback edition. Subsidiary rights, um, first serial, second serial, um, permissions, um, I probably would give those. Once again, I'm not keen on giving sort of paperback or ebook. Um, you would never give film. You would never give um, any of those um, sort of those rights if you had them. Those should always reside with you and never with um, a, a license like this. Price in the market. They need to tell you what the price is because that's part of your advanced calculation. And whatever price they give you usually is Roy. Um, VAT or HST included. So you need to get it. Um, you never get a royalty paid on uh, tax. So you need to ask them to clarify whether this is that excluded. Um, <clears throat> royalty right, rates, my key thing with this is it's escalating. Never take a flat royalty if you can avoid it. Because if the book is successful, then you should be able to, and particularly your author, should be able to partake in success. So you might start off with something as low as 6%, depending on the market, but I would try and get up to 10 for a paperback and up as high as 15 for a hardcover. So the advance is, uh, once again, this is not an auction. This is just, if you have one deal, it's based on print run times selling price times royalty, which equals your dollars, payment terms, once again, um, if it's below, I don't know, 1500 euros or 1500 pounds, I would want 100% upfront because the bank charges would kill you. If it's over that amount, I would do 50-50 or yeah, I would keep it 50-50. If it's a huge amount of money, say 20,000 euros, I might do a third on signing of the deal, third on, um, on, I don't know, 90 days later or a year later, and then a third on publication. The file fee. A file fee um, is applicable, applicable if, um, usually if it's English language, um, 
um, maybe if it's if, if it's a kid's book and it's um, illustrated, um, people ask me, what do I charge? Um, offset fees for English language are usually anywhere between $4 to $5 a page. It really depends on the market. If I'm um, sub-licensing into sort of the Ukraine or maybe um, a market that's not very big, the fee will be a lot lower than if I'm um, selling to a US publisher. Um, this fee um, is basically to offset your design and production costs. So it is, it is not to be shared with the author, it is to offset your costs. And then a publication schedule. This is very important to have, and it's very important to write into the deal that, um, that um, um, when they're going to publish the book. Is it going to be a year from now, two years from now? Because if they don't publish the book within a certain time, you should get the rights back. It could be that the publisher doesn't have the capability of doing it. It could be the publisher's on the verge of bankruptcy. It could be all sorts of things. But um, you want to know that the book is going to be published within a year or two years. That means you're going to get your final bit of money. You'll see the book. Um, it might give you um, another opportunity to sell rights or anything like that. It's really, really important to have that publication schedule. And then once the deal is all done and you've, and you've um, agreed terms, announce the deal. Um, Canadians tend to be very shy about announcing, announcing these things. I announce things on Quill and Choir. I announce them um, in Publishers Marketplace. And from announcing deals, it's amazing how many other deals I've gotten. So people, editors like to be part of success stories. And if if the deal is doing really, if the, if the book is doing really well and you've got two or three deals, people, editors from other countries are going to be really interested in why did this, you know, Agostini in Italy buy Things Are Good Now? Maybe I should buy it. And that's a short story collection. So, you know, you can sell these, these things, especially if, um, if uh, other people get interested. Um, okay. Any questions on deals? I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. Um, chat, yep, nothing in the Q&A. Okay. Next two slides. Um, just, this is the concept design artwork for the breadwinner. So this is what the aircraft pictures and Cartoon Saloon took around to pitch to people like Angelina Jolie to get this film done. It took nearly 10 years from the date that I did this deal with Aircraft Pictures for it to be, get enough money to get it into production. It, it was, it took a long time, but oh my God, it was so worth it, like the, the, if, if you haven't seen the, the um, feature, it is absolutely stunning. They did an amazing job. Anyway, next slide. So just at the side, at the bottom picture is the, the uh, um, I think it's the 15th anniversary edition of um, Deb Ellis's The Breadwinner, which basically every grade six kid in Canada, actually in North America, reads. And then at the top is the French edition from France. So it was Hachette, uh, took a still from the movie and re um, did their book. They called it Pravana, they didn't call it, which is the central character, they didn't call it the breadwinner. And then um, the film, we took the artwork from the film and made a graphic novel. And then I sold that to everyone who had originally published the breadwinner um, to be published um, simultaneously with the film coming out. So um, one of the questions that people asked before the, this was um, they wanted to hear more about uh, film option rights. And I'm just going to start off with this is, this is a quick overview. Um, you would really actually need to do a whole segment on film um, because film is very, <laughs> as I said, film deals can be very complicated. Um, so one of the key 
points about film that I think is really crucial is um, when you get somebody making an offer for your book is to involve the creators sooner than later. This is because of moral rights. And I don't know if people know about moral rights, but um, moral rights are part of the copyright law in Canada. It's not part of the copyright law in the US. Um, they originated, this moral rights originated in copyright law in France, actually. Um, and moral rights cannot be sold. They can only be waived. And so when you're doing a deal with your authors or creators or the illustrators, um, they have not waived their moral rights when you do a deal with them. So if you're going to do a film deal or even an audio deal, you need to talk to the creators to make sure that they're willing to waive their moral rights. Because when you do a film deal, that will be one of the key things that will be asked of you and you can't do that. Um, film companies often think that you can do that and you keep telling them you can't. So there has to be a separate part of the agreement to um, waive the moral rights. And that's why it's really important to get them on board um, as soon as possible so that they're aware of that you're negotiating a film deal, they're happy with the film company. And I would say this is particularly important with indigenous uh, writers. Um, um, it, it, I was working at Second Story and they, do, they did this really great series with Michael Hutchinson, who's indigenous. Um, it was um, middle grade and we were talking to two or three film um, companies and I talked to him um, about the film companies and he, he was pretty clear on, on what he wanted for indigenous involvement in the film companies. He didn't really care if the producer was indigenous, but he really, the, the actors had to be indigenous and obviously the more people on the film team needed uh, who were indigenous needed to be indigenous. So it's, it's, it's talking to, to them on what he felt was, he was gonna be comfortable with. So what you're negotiating are, are potentially two deals. Um, there's the option purchase agreements. They tend to be one agreement. Um, I'm telling you to be aware of telefilm rules because telefilm is where a lot of the Canadian producers get their money from, their seed money. And um, they have to have a deal for a book that lasts for at least three years. So option agreements um, used to in the old days could only be a year renewable. Nowadays, in order for them to get telefilm money and other funding, they have to have a three year agreement. So no producer is going to, to negotiate with you for anything shorter than three years. Um, option payments are anywhere between $500 and the sky's the limit. It depends on, on what you're optioning. If it's a debut author that nobody knows, it's probably $500. If it's um, Deborah Ellis's The Breadwinner and you've sold over 2 million copies, I'm not gonna tell you how much it was optioned for. It's optioned for a lot more than $500. Um, but it's because it had a track record and I could point to the track record. And more importantly, I could point to the international track record because no Canadian film or television show can be done without co-producers. And if you're dealing with a book that has um, multiple rights deals done, then the Canadian producer is gonna be much more interested in optioning it because that means they can go to different territories and say, this book is published in your territory. It's done really well in your territory. Why don't you give me some money? You can't, you can't do that if you haven't sold rights. So this is another reason to sell rights. It makes your book much more um, of interest to film producers or television producers. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's pretty important to try and get your book as best selling as possible before you start negotiating with producers. Usually with the option agreement, there is a purchase agreement attached to it. And one of the things that I can say to you that um, I negotiate these purchase agreements, I negotiate them as if this is going to be the biggest blockbuster ever. I don't leave anything on the table. Um, and I am very, very, very aware of what the Screenwriters Guild of Canada agreements are for screenwriters. I have the website here and in your resources, I've given you the link to their their uh, list of how much screenwriters earn. And you can use that as a basis for your negotiations. If the screenwriter is getting X, why is my author getting Y? 
Um, and, and producers don't want me saying this, but that's a lot of what I do um, is I'm very clear that without my book, you're not gonna have a film. So you need to have my author paid for in a very fair way, especially if the book becomes successful. One of the things that they'll offer you is um, a percentage of the uh, profits. Films don't make profits. So that's basically percentage of nothing. So there's ways around that, A, getting as big a purchase price as you possibly can. Um, there are other ways around that um, um, that I, you know, it's too complicated to go into and have to do another sort of seminar, but, but there are ways around, yes, you need to have your, you get 10% of the profits or whatever net profits, but the key word is net profits. So define net profits um, and make sure that um, you are actually getting as much money as you possibly can upfront because you won't get as much money at the back end as you possibly think you can. Television and kids stuff, there might be some merch money um, that you'll get, um, but, but it's less so um, than you would think. Um, when I was doing Franklin, it was much more lucrative on the merch and the um, broadcasting side than it is now. Another thing that producers, especially Canadian producers are doing now are something called shopping agreements. I'm on the fence on them. Shopping agreements basically mean no money up front. They're shorter, they're about six months, maybe a year if you're kind. I would probably not give them more than six months on a shopping agreement. There is no purchase agreement attached to that. That is in your favor. Because basically what they're doing is they're taking your book and they're going to broadcasters and say, if I can get a deal together, would you take this book? So if CBC or Netflix or Amazon Prime say yes, then they come back to you wanting to do a purchase, an option purchase agreement so that they can get. This actually is kind of good because then it puts you a little bit more in the driver's seat. You know who they're talking to, or you should. Um, and then maybe you can negotiate a little harder on the purchase and the option agreement than you would if they were just coming to you cold turkey. Um, the other key thing for me is keep all stage rights, they'll ask for them, and all book rights when you're negotiating with producers. They will ask for everything. They will ask for all merch, they will ask for all stage rights, they will ask for everything. You don't have to give them everything. And if they walk away, then you probably actually don't wanna do that deal. As you can see with the breadwinner, I was able to do a graphic novel because I had the rights. They didn't have the rights. Um, I was able to do, um, so I'm able to do spinoff books. Um, I'm able to re-cover um, um, my books so that I could tie it in with the film if I want, or not. If I'm not happy with the film, then maybe I don't wanna recover my book. Um, maybe the film is going to be a disaster, so you don't want to have anything to do with the film. But if they have the rights to do books, then um, you have the potential for having a whole bunch of competition in the market that's going to take away from your original book. You never want to give up any book rights if you possibly can. And stage rights is really funny. They always ask for stage rights and then they never do anything with them. Um, they, producers seem to think stage rights compete with, um, with the film. And I don't understand, I've never understood the logic of that. I mean, Come From Away, which is one of the biggest stage theatrical shows coming out of Canada, they're just releasing a film. Well, they wouldn't have the film without the stage. Like, and Franklin had a stage, we, had, we did um, theatrical releases of Franklin like five years before they ever did the television show and it didn't hurt the television show at all. Um, um, we did a television deal with um, Stella, Sam, Stella and Sam and, and I, I don't know, theater ne never heard it, but they seem to have a thing about it. Um, research the producers, make sure that this producer is going to do what they say they're going to do. Look at what else they've done. And this is really important to make the creator comfortable um, with um, um, what's gonna happen with their book because they're gonna have to sign, sign away their moral rights. And what that means is 
is the character going to change at all? Is it going to go? And I'm just stretching here. So it's a female character. It becomes a male character, like out of the blue. Um, um, is it uh, set in Toronto? Toronto's kind of a, a character of the book, um, like in the skin of the lion um, by Michael Andache. And then all of a sudden it's set in New York. Well, maybe I don't want it set in New York. Maybe it's really a Toronto book. Um, maybe it's a set in, um, it's a story of Saskatoon and all of a sudden it's based in Vancouver. Well, do you really want it based in Vancouver? Um, so, so you need to be, maybe there is a really good reason. Maybe they can get money from Vancouver film, um, um, government money. And so it's going to be based in Vancouver and that's why, but I think it's really important to for the creator to be comfortable with the producer and what the produ what the producer's vision is with that book. I haven't seen too many disasters because I've been pretty careful about who I license to, and I've always made sure that the authors are on board. But I'm very cognizant that once they sign that moral rights waiver, and no matter how tight you can make it, it is a it's done and the producer can basically do what they want with the book. Um, and then walk away, like walk away. Um, sometimes the, the authors get really excited about a film deal and want you to sign it no matter what. Um, I will do that, obviously it's their book, but um, I would advocate walking away and I have walked away. Um, from from deals before because I was not comfortable with a what was on offer and what their vision was and then if you do reach a deal with somebody consult an entertainment lawyer not just a lawyer an entertainment lawyer who knows entertainment law once you have a template agreement you probably maybe don't need to um, consult a lawyer I would still recommend talking to a lawyer um, because deals can be very, very, very complicated. Um, but um, yes, consult a lawyer. Don't not consult a lawyer. Um, any questions on film? Um, I'm not seeing any questions. I'll give everyone a second here. Um, Does anybody have any film deals there? that they've done and are happy with? I'm not seeing anything in the chat or the Q&A so far. Okay, next. Oh, somebody has two underway. Oh, congratulations. It's exciting. Actually, film deals are, they're hard to negotiate, but they can be really exciting. Um, okay, so my final thoughts. Um, negotiate any contract that you're doing, whether it's a rights contract, an audio contract, um, film contract, as if your book is a bestseller. Um, give as little away as possible um, and, and make sure that, um, if the book is going to be successful, you have escalators, um, built into the contract, uh, so that you can, you and your author can participate in the success of the book. Um, make sure that the creators are properly notified of a sale and that they're remunerated for their work. Um, one of the things that I negotiate when I'm doing deals is for, especially for the subsidiary rights is instead of the usual 50, 50, I usually ask for 60, 40, because I have to share whatever I get with the author. And I think it's important that the, the publisher who's doing the deal keeps less because they get to keep all of it themselves. And I have to share with the creators announce all your deals. Everyone loves a success story. Um, um, and, you know, announce it in Quill Inquire in Publishers Marketplace. Um, and and it's, it's great. And it's great for Canada that more and more of these um, Canadian authors are out there. And, you know, with, with Frankfurt 2020, I think they wanted to do something like 150 deals um, before Frankfurt 2020. And they've done 
I think twice that. So we are getting out there and that's really great. Selling rights takes time and effort, but the benefits are huge. And don't expect to go to one fair, meet a bunch of people, do a bunch of deals, and then never go again. Um, probably your first book fair, you will not make a deal. Um, you will meet people, you will pitch to people, people will ghost you, people will not get back to you or just will say no. Um, but it's, it's important to go back. I find it takes basically three trips to one fair to find out if it's successful or not. Um, and by successful, I mean that I am meeting with people who I think I can make a deal with. There are publishers where I have talked to them for two to three years, nothing happened. And then all of a sudden I had a book that was part of a series that um, they took on and it became a runaway bestseller. There was a big publisher in Australia that I talked to about the same book and they refused to take it, refused to take it. And then one Bologna, I looked at her and went, do you know how many copies I've sold of this book? that you have said no to me constantly. And she said, no. And I said, I have sold this and the UK publisher has sold that. You really need to look at this book. And they bought it and they had to reprint before they even had released the book. But that was, I had met with this woman five fairs and she still wouldn't buy this book. So I think um, persistence is important. Not being a pain is important. Um, and knowing your clients, knowing, um, getting to know them and asking them questions about their list, about what they're excited about, what the market is doing, what the trends are. Because one of the key things to selling rights is to start that conversation. And it's got to be a conversation because you're talking to editors and publishers who are equally passionate about their books as you are about yours. And the more passionate, the more you can, you know, channel into that passion, the better success you will get in selling your books, because you will get to know them and know what they want. And hopefully you will have that book that they want. Any questions? Um, any questions, anyone? It looks like we've got about seven minutes left. Um, well, we've got a question here. It says, is business done in English at the various international fairs? Yes, thank goodness. Um, uh, I started my rights career in, uh, in England and they tended to hire rights people who were multilingual. Um, so, which was probably a good thing. Um, I am not, I barely speak French. I'm a, um, I have, but I have found most people that you're dealing with will speak English. Um, they, they tend to, to read the books in English and things like that. Um, but is it good to have another language? Yes. Um, the publisher at Groundwood um, is Guatemalan and she speaks English, French, um, Spanish and German. And um, that was, I think, one of the reasons why um, Groundwood did so well with rights is because she could read a lot of the books um, that she was looking at in those languages and she could speak those languages. So do I recommend speaking another, having somebody speak another language? Yes. Do I speak another language? No. And have I been successful? Yes. So, um, but, you know, I also hired people, like I hired Jillian Fizet as my rights manager and director, and she speaks French, German, and English. So I do tend to hire people if I can speaking another language, but you can go to these fairs and speak English perfectly. Um, any other questions, folks? Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Um, somebody in the pre-questions asked how to, deter how to determine a reasonable offer for a right sale when you're the seller. Um, I think that calculation that I gave you answers that question. Um, what you want to know is the print run. I'll just repeat it. You want to know the print run. You want to know the selling price, excluding um, tax. 
um, and uh, you want to settle on a royalty and then you multiply them all together and that is your advance. Um, so that is the best way of, of calculating an advance. Um, but that's only if it's not on an auction. If it's an auction, you know, there is no ceiling. Um, I think I went over pitching the best titles to pitch. Now, somebody asked in a writer illustrator partnership, do both partners have signing authority? And I don't quite understand that question. So I didn't understand it. I'm assuming the writer illustrator partnership is, is um, put together by the publisher. This is how it works in my experience. Um, the writer, you know, the manuscript submitted to the publisher, the publisher, um, picks an illustrator, you do separate contracts for both of them, but it doesn't matter if they're separate contracts, they still created a copyrightable work. And so they still have moral rights over the copyrightable work. And um, they still have, depending on your contract, um, um, certain rights over the book. So I would still consult with them, both of them. Um, over whatever right steal you're doing. Um, but signing authority, I'm assuming once they've given you the contract, once you've signed up a contract, um, you have the authority to do any subsidiary right steals. Um, but if I've misunderstood that question, um, somebody can email me later or you can clarify in the question and answer. And I think that was it for all the questions. Sounds good. Well, it looks like we're pretty much at the end of our time slot here. Um, okay. So thank you, Barbara, um, for thank your you. wonderful presentation. It's great to have you. And thank you for everyone for um, participating and for your really thoughtful questions. Um, it was a really interesting talk today. Um, I'll follow up um, for those that had um, questions about a few contacts or who may need the resources as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to send them to um, either Barbara, as she said, or um, if it's something that I can help you with to investment at creativesask.ca. Um, and hope everyone has a really great afternoon. Bye. Bye everyone.